Big Fluff. You can do anything. Go anywhere. Like the vacation planet. Surf a 50-foot monster wave in Hawaii. You can ski down the pyramids. You can climb Mount Everest with Batman. Check out this place. It's a casino the size of a planet. You can lose your money there. You can get married. You can get divorced. You can, you can go in there. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay because of all the things they can be. Tall, beautiful, scary, a different sex, a different species, live action, cartoon. It's all your call. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Joel Murphy. And I'm Andy McIntyre. And this is Silver Linings Playback, the podcast where we watch maligned movies and we find their silver linings. And uh, we decided for the month of June, we're going to give the old capitalism a try. Yeah, why we're not? Grab that cash. Yeah. Cash grab month, baby. LGTM, let's get this money. And uh, just at the top, I want to say that Cash Grab Month is brought to us by our Patreon, where you can give us cash to grab. Yep, you can help us grab some of your cash. Yep. Patreon.com slash Silver Linings Playback. And uh, you can decide to help us grab cash by picking out movies and, you know, having some, some say in what we talk about on the pod. Because if you because you didn't sign up you didn't get to pick the movie this month nope no we picked it that's we picked it yep but you can bribe us we are open to your bribes it won't take much no we're we're very cheap we're very affordable in our being bought yeah i mean although our our reels are now getting into the six figures on social media so look the the results are in and as much as you and I gave Devin a hard time, people love the movie Jack. According people do to In- love the movie Jack. Yes. So what Instagram Our apologies has made to me Devin re- McKay. Yes. He was right. We were wrong. Uh, people love that clip of, of the movie on Instagram. So <laughs> yeah. thank you, everyone who watched it, which is a lot of people. Yeah, it is, it is more people than the towns either of us grew up in. That is accurate. So. Yeah, we, we finally got to a level of uh, weird Internet comments that seemed disconnected from the reality of what was posted. So that that meant a lot to me. Yeah, that 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 is a sign that you've made it. Ultimately. Yeah, that when the woodwork opens up and releases weirdos who write bizarre uh, <laughs> things that you're like, what? How did you get that from this movie? Yeah, How did that lead to that? Like, yeah, it's a journey Smollett. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people uh, very excited about Journey Smollett. A lot of people very excited to point out that she was in Full House. Which Nobody was. talking about um, uh, the emancipation of Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. I don't think that it seemed like some of the people were not aware that she is adult actor Journey Smollett. <laughs> and we're naming a that, lot of things yeah, she did as a kid. That could be. That could be. But um, also go watch Birds of Prey. Just, yeah, it's a good flick. Yeah. Uh, maybe even top five that we've watched for this pod. It's definitely up there. And I know that they were at one point there was supposed to be the Lovecraft Country showrunner was supposed to be making a a spinoff starring Journey Smollett's character. A Black Canary spinoff. But I don't know what happened with that. I mean, it's probably got made in Zaslav just burned it for, uh, you know, a write off. So it's just on the boat. Yeah, it's on his boat. Anyway, that is not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about blatant cash grabs and we're kicking off the month with Ready Player One. Which may be the least blatant cash grab, like on the surface, but if you saw the clip, like that's it's it is chock full of member berries, and you know it's not i I wouldn't consider adapting a highly successful novel into a movie with uh a semi famous director, I guess. Um, I don't know. Did this guy do other stuff? Because I don't like just I wasn't very impressed with this movie and I didn't really dig very deep. But I whoever directed it doesn't seem like someone who's worked very much in Hollywood and probably didn't do a lot after this either. Yeah. Um, but 
this movie is so unnecessarily chock full of established IP and like I said, member berries that that is the cash grab portion of this. Well, here's a good example. I pulled this because as you know, uh, Andy and I, we usually, we like to go to IMDb, look at the trivia there. I, I pulled one just not because I thought it was an interesting piece of trivia, but because I thought it points to exactly why we're doing this movie this month. So I'm just going to read this during the scene inside the shop. In the background, you can see the flying RV from Spaceballs, the EVA pod from 2001 A Space Odyssey, a Colonial Viper from Battlestar Galactica, a Starfighter from Buck Rogers, ED-209 from Robocop, and a Loader from Aliens. That's the movie. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, in that opening clip, you saw... I mean, they name checked Batman, Mm -hmm. but there's also a very obvious Marvin the Martian. There were Battletoads. Yeah. Um, lots of other very vaguely recognizable IP. You know, it, that's the movie. And like, there are a lot of moments where, for example, during the climactic battle, Chucky is in it. And they're like, oh, my God, it's Chucky. Or they're throwing the hand grenade, the holy hand grenade from, from Monty Python, from Monty Python. Or there's the Zemeckis cube. There's a Zemeckis cube or the, the main character drives the DeLorean from Back to the Future. Uh, throughout the movie, the Iron Giant is in it. Godzilla Mecha is in Godzilla. It. Yeah, Mega Godzilla, King Kong, a Gundam wing. There's an entire sequence that I do want to talk about in more detail that takes place uh, within the settings of The Shining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's yeah. It, it's this movie was made for those YouTube videos that I don't like. That's just like. Easter eggs in thing. And then it's just all the things you missed in all the things you missed. And it's just a freeze frame. It's just that every scene has 50 pieces of IP in it at all times. But shout out to the new Rockstars YouTube channel because those guys seem fun. Sure. Yeah. Uh, But it's just. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that's not my thing of just. Isn't it cool that this thing is in this movie? And it's like, I guess. Sure. I I know that thing. It feels like a eight year old playing with all of his toys all at once. That's 100 percent what this movie is. I do think it's a little weird that like we both talked on record. You can hear it in probably all 300 plus episodes that we've done mentioning how much we love reading the IMDb trivia. Um but that's essentially what a lot of those YouTube channels are. It's just YouTube, like just a YouTuber rereading the IMDb trivia. Yeah. Also, we've only done 200 some episodes. I don't know. You're you're padding our stats. I just want to be accurate. 4,000 episodes. <laughs> it feels like 4,000. But yeah, we're only we just broke 200 recently. So. OK, yeah, I'm just I'm here for accuracy's sake. That's what I'm, about. I'm. I'm here for freewheeling good times, baby. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there's just a lot of that. And and the book from what I, I've never read the book, but from what I understand, the book has that. And then there are things in the movie that aren't in the book and things in the book that aren't in the movie, because that's just how you can get away with a lot more in books of name checking things. And then with movies, you have to very much clear the rights. Like, I yeah. know a big one was Starman uh, that they wanted. Uh, or not Starman. Um. What is it? What was the thing at the end? I'm saying Starman. That's the Jeff Bridges movie. But uh, whatever. There was a thing that they wanted that they had to use Mecha Godzilla instead. Oh, Ultraman. Ultraman. Yeah. <laughs> Although if it was a giant Jeff Bridges, I would have enjoyed that as well. From scratch. <laughs> I mean, it is accurate to say that our heroes built uh, a iron giant in a garage. Okay, what a bunch of scraps. Um, yeah, I have read the book, uh, and the book is very dystopian. Um, and like intentionally, it's like it's a, it's a work of dystopian, you know, sci-fi, which is you know like two thirds of sci-fi probably. Yeah, it's either <laughs> Star Trek, which is more like a utopian sci-fi, or everything else is dystopian. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but yeah, it's uh, and there's a like, there's a lot of things that the way they happen in the book, like you, they wouldn't be fun cinematically. So like some of the changes make sense, but at the same time, like 
the movie dumbed things way down and made the characters way dumber. And like, that was stupid. All right. I don't. Well, oh, first of all, I guess we didn't properly set this up, but the clip at the beginning did a little bit. But essentially it takes place, I think, in 2045. It's in the near distant or the near distant, the near future. And the it's a world where everyone is online. Hard to imagine. Uh, and the the actual living world has completely gone to hell. But then the guy who created the Oasis has died and he's Willy Wonka the the Internet uh, so that if anyone can find these three keys, they will get possession of it. But the people who, you know, have taken over his company, mainly Ben Mendelsohn, uh, they're. They're trying to get control of the company, so they're trying to stop any players from getting these keys first. And that's essentially the whole thing. And then we have a ragtag group of friends who must come together to get the keys and save the Internet from. Can you imagine? I mean, this movie, this dystopian movie is warning us about a future where the Internet is controlled by some evil, powerful (laughs) singular corporation that they control what you do you know could you imagine if like one company controlled facebook and instagram and like really controlled what you saw on the internet and like what was able to get through to you yeah that's crazy because there are three companies that control all of the internet (laughs) exactly and they're they're checking each other i'm sure yeah they're keeping everything in line and between and we have, uh, you know, Elon Musk, who's such a good guy. He bought one of the tech giants and just tanked it. So it's not even relevant anymore. He's the real hero in all of this. Yeah, He's looking out for us. He's like, I'm taking one down and then maybe he'll buy Facebook, run that into the ground. You know, just keep helping us out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this movie, it's set in like the real world, which is awful. And then uh, this virtual world that is like anything is possible. It's like this giant VR world where you can literally do anything. And what I want to know is why wasn't everyone Batman? Well, right. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing too. Like you can climb Mount Everest with Batman is what he says in that opening clip. First of all, don't want to do that. Second of all, I just want to be in Gotham city as Batman. Yeah. Like just that. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to be like, we established, we want to be the guy in the chair for Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah, well, but, th- that is true. This is verging into they were on treadmills and moving around. Although, I don't know. It's kind of mixed. Some It seemed like you had the possibility. Some people were like running in place and doing a lot of stuff, but other people seemed to just be suspended and they didn't have to move a lot. So if I could be one of the not have to move a lot, guys, I could be Batman. Yeah, there's um, there's a lot of things in this movie that don't make sense. Like, why would you want a suit that makes the like pain feel real like what's the what's the advantage well i guess it makes everything feel real and there was a a little wink wink implication that i guess you could you know like fool around with someone in the suit okay yeah i don't know i could also get punched in the dick well it seems like something you would want to be able to turn on and off like if you're if you were about to get in a real fight i'd like to be able to be like stop you know it's well, that's like the other the other weird thing, like when they're in dangerous situations, there seems to be no penalty for just taking off your visor and logging out like there doesn't seem to be a hard process. So why was anyone ever in danger? Well, especially when you combine that with if you die in the game, you lose every possession that you have, which. Yeah. So that would be all that would happen is anytime anyone was about to die, they would pull their visor Boop. off. And yeah. you, it would be it'd be like that one episode of 30 Rock where all the writers are playing. Uh, I forget what game they're playing, but they're playing a, a shooter game against each other. But they all keep killing themselves to avoid getting it, letting anyone else kill them. And it's just going on and on forever with zero kills. That would be everything in that you would just every single person would pull their visor off when they were about to die. I mean, I feel like there's probably it, it seemed like in the game, like there were situations where. It was near unavoidable. The death. Well, someone snuck up on you or something. But anytime you you knew you were about to die, like you're driving and you can see that King Kong has grabbed your car and is going to eat you. You pull the visor off. Yeah, one would think you would think. Um, uh, well, also, if we're doing this, can we can I talk about two 
of the my particular pet peeves like that they do in this that are sort of like internet pet peeves uh in movies like this one everyone lives in the same town everyone lives within yeah. five minutes it's the internet and everyone lives within five minutes of each other yeah that was like one thing in the book um it was i think uh our hero parsable wade watts and his love interest did both live in Columbus, but uh, Sho and Daito lived in China and Japan, respectively, and H lived somewhere else. They did all end up coming together uh, to try to help, like, win the thing. But. Yeah, they didn't all live in the same place. Yeah, which is like, I guess it was maybe just streamlined for. Yeah, but it is just. Yeah, I, I don't know. That that always annoys me in in stuff like this. And then the other thing, well, this is not specific to um video game things, but it's actually this is more and more specific to things that take place in the future. So these are people, these are kids, they're young people online in 2045. So 20 years from now. So these are some of them have not been born yet. I don't think any of them have been born yet in present mm. day. The fact that they're constantly going like it's a Zemeckis game, like to some extent, if you're a nerd, you have a, a healthy respect for the past. But all of the references are like, am I getting punked or like, you know, they're very obsessed with the pop culture that you and I are interested in. And we are way too old to care about any of this stuff in like. I hope in 2045 I'm not on the metaverse <laughs> like playing alongside these 20 year olds, you know? Yeah, that's something the book did a little better because um, it built. Obviously, books can build out worlds a little bit more effectively. Um, and they sort of explained because uh, Willy Wonka was so obsessed with like that sort of 80s era pop culture. All the people that were hunting the eggs like built into that obsession because the book is much more of like a treatise on obsession as much as it is like an adventure story in a dystopian future. Um, and that, that explains why they were all into the same things that, uh, whatever his name was, um, not Simon Pegg, I believe is not name. Simon Pegg. Yeah. Which, okay. Uh, so let, let me just Mark get violence is the actor's name. Yeah. I'm blanking on the, uh, the character name, but yeah. let me get my third biggest like thing with this out of the way. That's related to all this. Since I mentioned him, how are you going to cast Simon Pegg? In your movie and what's really a, a very minor bit part and give him a weird American accent. Would it have mattered at all if he spoke in his normal accent? No, no. And instead, I have to watch a whole movie where I'm like, hey, look, it's Simon Pegg. And then he's like, hey, I've been following you from afar. I've been a secret. I think mentor. you made the right decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There was nothing in the rules that said I couldn't help you. Like, it's just I love Simon Pegg so much, but it was it would have been distracting if he did a not weird American accent, but he did a weird American accent. There's no reason he couldn't have been English. Right. Because they they're just partners that worked on a thing together. So he was British and then he came to America at the time that they met each other. It wasn't like they were childhood friends or anything. No, I mean, in the in the book, I mean, these, these guys obviously draw parallels between Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the founders of Apple. And Simon Pegg's character is based on um, Steve Wozniak. And then uh, Mark Rylance's character is based on Steve Jobs. But uh, yeah, there's no reason like. Who cares if then he's talking in a stilted British person kind of doing an American accent? Yeah, it just I, I did not like it. Also, did oh, you I, say mean, I, I will say on the whole, I think British actors are better at American accents than American actors are at British accents. Yeah, no, I th that's very true. Uh, yeah, but yeah. And also, but, while we're at it, Australians are absolutely phenomenal at doing american accents like they're the best because do you know how many times i've been like wait that person's australian like what yeah margot robbie is astonishingly good at american accents well and does a variety like she can do yeah. like the sort of standard like newscaster american accent she can when she does harley quinn it's like a very new york it's like a 
yeah, yeah. Brooklyn style accent. Yeah. Um, no, she she can do all of them, you know, flawlessly. Yeah. Ben Mendelsohn, Australian. Mm hmm. And Mendelssohn does a lot of different accents well. Yeah, he's God, he's the best. We'll get to him later. Yeah. The, <laughs> I do. While we're talking about him now, though, in this portion, I what did you think of his like handsome Squidward <laughs> avatar? <laughs> I'm here for it all the way. I'm all in. <laughs> yeah. It's the, like I, I just I, I one thing and this is, again, um, a silver lining, but just like how dull and uncreative he was, his character his avatar basically looks identical to him, just a little more buff. Yeah, he looks like a younger, jacked up version of him, for sure. You know, still wears a suit, like, you know, all that thing. Um, you know, his password was like boobs or no, boss man 69. Like, yeah. that was great. Which I shouldn't say this on the air, but that's also my password. So it's I, also my password. I mean, yeah. whoa, geez. <laughs> we should both change those, I think. Yeah. Boss man 70. Shit. <laughs> 69 boss man that's what i'm going with. <laughs> big boss man 69 i think that's already taken by uh he's no longer with us right now ray trailer has has passed on may he rest in peace i like this is not here w i mean I, i've heard to say that uh ray trailer uh definitely lived his life on his own terms uh but now he's six feet underground getting eaten by worms that's true <laughs> i do want to this is this is just such uh, an aside but i think one of on the this show one of the finest first of all one of my favorite pay-per-views if not my favorite uh of all time is survivor series 1998 um, oh yeah it's great but it has a moment in it that is a small thing but i think is is one of the most impressive things i've ever seen in a wrestling match because there's so many ways it could have not worked but when boss man went to toss his nightstick into the ring and the rock one hand caught it to intercept it to use it in the match which then turns out to be a plan but we didn't know that at the time but it's the way the rock caught that with his fingertips of one hand is so impressive <laughs> and it's i don't know how he actually caught it like i i think it was a borderline bad throw but he pulled it in and it was beautiful. And that was a night that everything was just working in wrestling. Yeah, that that, that pay-per-view is is start to finish phenomenal. It is. Even it's, though it is a full night tournament, like it's there's not a ton of wasted motion. It's way better than the WrestleMania 4 tournament um, upon which it was based. It's great. Well, because it's full of a bunch of different storylines that are all coming together, because you have the Shane McMahon stuff, you have the Mick Foley has been sucking up uh to the powers that be and thinks that he's crowned the champion it's good we're not going to talk about it anymore but it's no we're, we'll move on but yes it's it phenomenal great. if you've never watched survivor series 98 it's it's a work of art um anyways back to ready player one mm -hmm. which surprisingly i don't think has any wrestling references in it as much as it has a bunch of other re references yeah that's i think the one thing that's largely absent uh and you figure if uh, Mark Rylance was a fan of pop culture in the 80s, he would have been into wrestling. Yeah, there there would be a Hulk Hogan reference or something. Because, yeah, he would have. He definitely had to have watched 80s wrestling, if not yeah. early 90s as well. Um, Which also, oh, my God. I mean, is he our age? Like, I don't know what. The he's math. a little bit. He's like 10 years older than us. OK. So, but he watched 80s wrestling. Like, he was probably, like, graduating college at the end of the 80s. Yeah, so he definitely, he he tapped in. Like, he watched it. Yeah. It may not have been a wrestling fan, but. But it's like, the 80s and 90s, I feel like it was on, wrestling was just in the the atmosphere. You know, like, it, yeah. it was so popular that you couldn't, that you, everyone had a passing awareness of it. Also, yeah, in a way, in a way, they don't anymore, even though wrestling is making more money than it ever has. But we're not talking about wrestling. We're talking about Ready Player One. Yes. Well, everything's more fragmented now. So I think that's part of it. Uh, but yes. Um, but also you have wrestlers that are big crossover stars. So like, you know, the you could have had an Andre the Giant and the Princess Bride or like The Rock's career or nothing Hogan did. Roddy all, Piper. All, yeah, Piper. But yeah, all of Hogan's movies are bad. But yeah, he, he likes horror movies. So like. He probably watched some John Carpenter stuff. He might have seen They Live. He watched They Live. He loved They Live. Yeah, for sure. 
A hundred percent. Which is what I would have been doing in the Oasis. Also, when I uh, I would be mostly Batman. But when I'm like, I need a break from being Batman, I would just be fine. You and I probably together would be recreating the Roddy Piper. uh, David Keith fight. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Just Keith Keith, David. David. Yeah. We would just be doing that fight and trying to. David Keith is a different unrelated actor. Yeah. He's good. He's good, too. He is good. Yeah. Yeah. He's no he's no Keith David, but. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, we'd be fighting over a pair of sunglasses that I'd be trying to put on your face. That would show me the truth about the Oasis. <laughs> Which is that it's a virtual world. And you'd be like, I already know this. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not real. <laughs> um, now, one thing and like and again, like I hate I don't want this to fully be like a book versus movie comparison. But one of the things the book did better was that like the Oasis was not just recreationally a second world like it was economically a second world like kids went to school in the oasis like there was like all of that stuff where um, which man that's gotta suck so you're a kid that goes to school in the oasis and then you get out of class you go to dune or whatever world you get killed and you lose all your homework it's just gone but it's what a built-in excuse (laughs) oh sorry i got i got like fragged last night i did my whole book report and then they fragged me i'm I'm so sorry um but yeah like one of the one of the plot holes that a lot of people have pointed out about this movie online is that so like the first key to go through the plot of the movie is you have to win a race against a bunch of other pop cult you have to win wacky races essentially yes yeah um and but it turns out that you can't win it conventionally. You have to cheat. Mm-hmm. What's one thing that all big time gamers do in games? Oh, that was I, I had this thought watching it of like, because all you have to do. And again, it's 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 a moment to show that our protagonist is smart. But he's like he he figures out something that Mark Ryland said. And he's like, oh, backwards. And so then he drives backwards. And someone would have accidentally driven backwards in the game. Like, but if not someone would have on purpose driven back. But yeah, it's like, again, I mean, when we were just talking about being uh, the Spider-Man's guy in the chair, like I love playing the Spider-Man games and sometimes I'll watch stuff of that on YouTube and people do everything. Like they figured out how to jailbreak venom in uh, the new Spider-Man game because you're supposed to only be able to play with them in a certain level. But then they're like, this is how to make venom free roam the city. You know, like they, anything that you can do in a game on day one, uh, you know, uh, thousands, if not millions of people are trying to jailbreak your game. immediately. Oh, just the, the extent of what people have done in Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is phenomenal. Right. Yeah. So absolutely someone would have tried to drive backwards immediately and would have figured that out. Yeah, it's um, so that like. That was dumb and bad. Yeah, well, like I, a lot of this movie, I do think there is a question of I think all three things could have just. All the keys could have been found by people not even necessarily playing the scavenger hunt. You know, because one is the so the first one is you drive backwards in Mario Kart. The second one is and I want to talk more about this place, but it's in the shining uh, like little uh, part of this. And I I'm pretty sure you just dance with the girl that he liked. Right. And then she gives you the key. Yeah, but like in the famous are, floating zombie ballroom scene from The Shining. OK, are we at this point? And we're done? well, OK, the, real quick. The third one is that you stand on this ice and then you uh, play a video game that everyone knows about that. You just have to find the Easter egg in the video game that seems well known by all these people that you said are aficionados of this Mark Rylance character. Someone would have figured right. that out, too. But, yeah, yeah. And that's one thing that like. I think the movie kind of did better that the movie, like the final key was that the first video game Easter egg, um, the very first like paragraph of the book explains that Easter egg. And then ta- that's how it like sets up the world of the Oasis. Um, but, and then the third key is something way more convoluted. Oh. Uh, and but, so I think it's almost, I, that's the one change I get, but someone would have figured that out first. Right. So I, that that is a thing. I think all the keys are easy to figure out, but fine. You you brought it up. So they do a shining thing, which 
Uh, and maybe when we get to the silver linings, we can talk more about how well they did recreating visually the shining, but it, then it's just like, here's stuff from the shining, but not in any sort of sensical way. You know, you get the woman in room 237, but then she's chasing after them in the, the hedge maze with a giant ax, which also a lot of it felt like they absolutely could not get Jack Nicholson's likeness, like permission to, yeah. <laughs> to show him. So I think that was a big part of why they had to do what they did. But it's like that you get the little girls, you get the, the woman in 237, but everything is just folded on top of each other. And then, yeah, they go into the ballroom, but the ballroom doesn't have a floor and it's full of zombies that then start eating people, you know. Just the like The Shining. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's um. so one of the things in the book that would, didn't make sense cinematically, and I think The Shining segment is kind of trying to pay hom- homage to that, but like one of the puzzles is that like you had to successfully act out some of his favorite movies to get through like to the next stage, essentially. Um, and so you had to basically know like chapter chapter line and verse like an entire movie to get through and i think that's sort of what that shining segment was getting at yeah okay you know because in, in the book like they had to act out all of monty python all of uh war games all of you know and like that gets explained in like three sentences in the book and it you know it it does enough whereas like the visual language to make that make sense would have been too hard and difficult but yeah the shining was very much and like it's like of course I remember The Shining. It's his fourth favorite horror movie. Yeah, it's like, what? Uh, also, I, I had this thought. Um, who do you think, uh, you know, one of them is still with us and the other, uh, may he rest in peace. But of the two of them, had they both watched it, who would hate that sequence more? Stephen King or Stanley Kubrick? Kubrick wouldn't have watched it. That's true. Yeah. But it's like, it's funny to me because they they even mention it in this movie that obviously Stephen King famously does not like Kubrick's uh, Shining because it's not the book. Like Kubrick very much did. Although his own thing. I, I have heard that Stephen King has now come around and said it is a very good movie on its own. It is a horrendous adaptation of my book. Right, which is the and right, that's the right take. Well, that's the yeah, that's just accurate. Uh, we also someday could and should watch. I, I've never seen it, but the Stephen Weber more accurate to the book shining we should definitely it's watch fine it. yeah but uh if, if it wasn't an eight hour miniseries i would definitely say let's do it <laughs> that's what we're doing for this october and then the rest of next october that we're just gonna watch an hour of <laughs> the shining perfect but yeah no notes um and steven weber if you're listening hit us up i have yeah. some i have some wings questions that are unrelated to that yeah, I sat behind you at a Broadway show once, so hey. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the zombies in The Shining, very weird choice. Like, I, I, I don't know what we're doing there. Like, what, 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 yeah, what they were it thinking. Just, it's just the movie didn't respect its audience enough to make it actually complex puzzles. It no. almost kind of seemed like. No, all the puzzles are very simple. Also, I, I just... I, I'm down with like simplifying everything if that's what you want to do, but then why is the movie two hours and 20 minutes long? <laughs> like, if we're two words, battle toads. Like, also, that should be the challenge. Like, one of the keys should be that you have to beat that level in battle toads where you're on the little jet skis and you're moving real fast. And it's just no that. one's ever beaten that level. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's how you get the key. There's no trick to it. You just have to beat that level that's impossible to beat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think those are like, oh, well, OK, I do have one more thing that I definitely have to talk about before we can pivot, which is what in the paint on her overalls ponytails are we doing with the love interest of like, don't look at me, I'm hideous. And then she is the most beautiful woman in the world with just like this with a port wine stain on her face with a port wine stain on her face that who one who cares she you know it doesn't whatever but also even if she was uncomfortable about it she could just probably cover it up with makeup i would think 
or like it makes her unique and hotter maybe it's, it's also possible that it makes her hotter but she is so beautiful and she's so like to look at me a- and also like no offense to to our main character but this fucking nerd is lucky <laughs> that any girl wants to be with him let alone a ridiculously beautiful one like yeah, Ty i just shared a not an attractive man no and it's just that plot. and he played cyclops so that all checks out the worst x-men um yeah no olivia cook is absolutely gorgeous um and british actually doing a uh, i didn't know that so doing a flawless american accent obviously significantly better than simon peck <laughs> um yeah and no she's gorgeous and you know, her avatar looks a lot like her, more like her than like Wade's looks like him. Way more than uh, Lena Waithe's look. H looks like Lena Waithe. Um, right. What's the also all of that is it felt very t- like I get it, but it's it's sort of tired to me. That whole idea, all of the reveals of like, oh, my God, you're a girl. Oh, my God, you're a little kid. And it's like, yes, of course, all of that is happening. You literally said it in the opening clip. I don't know if it was the part that we played, but in that it opening. Was. Yeah, the, the he covers that people do that. And then he's so shocked that his friend is one of the people doing that. Yeah, it's. um, It's ridiculous. I uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to pivot. Uh, like this movie is it's silly. It's too long. Uh, it's too it trans- reliant on, you know, member Barry's IP references. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not a full silver lining, but like, I like a good member Barry. I'm not going to lie. I, I can't co-sign the, I, it's, it's actually what I dislike about this movie the most is just. I don't maybe it's me and I recognize it as me because I know a lot of people do like this movie. I don't get excited to just be like, that's the Iron Giant. I'm like, yep, that is the Iron Giant. I I mean, that's about my level of excitement about it, but I'm like, oh, that's cool. I I like that thing. I don't I I don't have that. I maybe, you know, I don't know. Like, I'm not trying to I know we've pivoted, but I'm just saying it's not. So, no, I know. Yeah, it's I mean. It's like, you know, you know, to something it's this is one of those movies that like, were you to watch it multiple times, like it's busy enough that you can note and like it is well articulated. The world building is pretty solid. Like there's interesting stuff happening uh, out of focus in almost every scene. And there's some cool stuff that way. But I do. Uh, I know. Look, I know we pivoted. I'm not trying to sandbag. We, us, we're but... like pivoting. We haven't okay. pivoted. OK, well, then good. Then I'm going to get this in real quick. I do also think this movie is kind of to blame for that becoming a thing where, you know, when they made that new Space Jam movie or like there. This is now very oh, 100%. Po- popular to do this sort of big crowd scene full of Easter egg things that I, I want to say this movie started that like specific of that density of references. I might argue that it was uh, Phantom Menace with like the ETs and the Yodas in the Senate scenes. That's also fair too. But, but yeah, this one definitely steps it up with the amount of things. And then you can see that that became other things. Copy that of like, Oh, the internet will repost our clips and freeze frame them. And people will discuss it and rewatch them because it's a, it's a genius move in terms of like, if you're streaming this movie like on your platform, people will watch it over and over again in slow mo and like all of that. So you're you're getting numbers for sure. Uh, but yeah, I also I'll give them this too. I think that you know I guess we'll credit the book, but the movie as well was correct in that if you look around now, even at like Fortnite or things like that. It's incredibly popular to do those kind of tie ins of and I think they've done like Batman ones and stuff, but they'll they'll pick these different IPs and then like in Fortnite, your character can look like, you know, Harley Quinn or or whatever. They they do a lot of that. That is Mm -hmm. accurate that this sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, acquiring objects and skins from IP and and putting them into games that they don't inherently belong in is correct. They absolutely nailed that. Yeah. Um no, I think that but to, to I guess to fully pivot, like this movie is very well 
I don't want to say executed because there are millions of plot flaws and things like that. But like from a technical and standpoint, this movie is very well done. Yeah. Yeah. I Well, I think maybe what you're saying is I think the the VFX people, the the CG people who I'm sure uh, it was not easy to do. They they crushed. They're it. the real heroes. They, yeah, they are the it. real heroes. And And again, I mean, I said it when we talked about The Shining. Any like for this stuff to succeed, all of the the references, you visually have to be able to identify the thing, especially if it's in the background and especially if it's there for five seconds. So someone painstakingly had to put that there and make sure that you could recognize it. And yeah, they they made a 3D model and they rendered it correctly. And again, it might have flashed on the screen, but someone probably spent hours, if not weeks, if not months. Rendering at, that one battle toad. Yeah, that you hopefully noticed and then went around to all their friends being like, did you see the battle toad? I put that in there and then all their friends were like, what? The what now? They're battle toads? Huh? <laughs> yeah. So all of that, like those people, as you said, are the heroes. Like, absolutely. They they killed it. And and again, I was obviously having fun with Spielberg at the beginning. But one thing I think Spielberg has always done well, and it, you look at the fact that Jurassic Park holds up as well as it does, is the man seems to know how to integrate VFX and make them look good. And, and I hope has an appreciation for them and the people who make them. And that stuff tends to look good in his movies. Except those monkeys yeah. in Indiana Jones, but whatever. We're not going to we talk. We did a whole episode about that movie. We're not going to we're <laughs> not going to go down that path again. Um, but yeah, no, the 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 best thing about this movie. And I, I mean, there's other good things, but it is the painstaking time and effort put into realizing the Oasis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Like it's it's incredibly well done. Um, the second best thing is Ben Mendelsohn. Yeah. And the effort that went into to bringing us Ben Mendelsohn. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is as good a smarmy dick villain as we have working right now. He really is. I, you know what scene I, I think is his best scene is the one where he's trying to trick the protagonist into believing that, no, I'm like you. And he has a team of people feeding him. All of this just stuff. Just knowing him. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Like, that's great. Like, I like that he gets to be a little clever in that he he when they when they inception him, like yeah. that he figures it out, you know, that that he does as much as he has a dumb password and as much as he doesn't care about this world that he wants financial. Control he just wants of. to make a ton of money. Yeah. But uh, he he is clever, you know, and he's and he's very ruthless and he's willing to, you know, and it. It's also interesting because he definitely is also doing the the villain thing of like, I'll give you a bunch of money like uh, I'll buy you out right now. Like that's easier for me because I know that I'll make so much more money. So I, I don't want to yeah, name you. your price. I will. Yeah. Yeah. I will kill you, but I don't want to kill you because it would be easier to just write you a check. That's a lot less red tape for me if I just it's literally one signature and you have all this money. Yeah. Uh, um. And I mean, this credit goes to the author, but Sorrento is just a great villain name. It is. Yeah. No, I like it. Yeah, it's good. Um, but yeah, you know, he's he's great. Like, yeah. Yeah. Even at the end when he just loses it and he's about to murder uh, Ty Sheridan, like it's like, yeah, that checks. That tracks. I think he had time. I think he could have gotten that shot off. I think he might have been able to. <laughs> Also, I don't uh, look, we pivoted, but what is why do we almost do a, the whole town is going to rise up against him? And then he has one gun and they all step. And nobody has a weapon in that town, in that bad part of town. Those damn anti Second Amendment people finally won out <laughs> in 2045. That's the real dystopia. Let me tell you, that's actually the secret message of this movie. It's why it was made to. <laughs> <laughs> Partially funded by the NRA. Yeah, to be like, look, where's the good guy with the gun? They could have saved him. Could have saved him. Luckily, our friends, the police showed up. And look, we can all trust them to wrap things up neatly. <laughs> oh, my God. This movie, it it's pretends copaganda. to be moderately anti-capitalist, but it's actually very right wing. Yeah, it's copaganda. That's what, And then it's like, 
you know, the, 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 the black character is definitely like, I can trust the police. Like, let me go talk to them and they'll, they'll listen to me over the rich white guy and resolve things in my favor. Like that all, you know, also sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You can get wealthy and still keep friends. Capitalism. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, Mendelssohn crushing it. Absolutely. No, he's phenomenal. Um, I mean, Olivia Cook is really good in this movie. Like, I think uh, she. And, and she, courageous um, and courageous what? and courageous for w- being willing. For being willing to be put all that makeup on to have a port wine stain on her face. To, you know, it's it's Charlie's Theron and monster. I was going to say it's it's Nicole Kidman in the hours like it's. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm surprised that she was not Monica in the fat suit. <laughs> it is Monica in the fat suit. That's actually what it is. <laughs> I think that's the right comparison. But yeah, like so brave of her to to be so hideous in this movie. But no, yeah, she's I mean. She is very charming, like all throughout the movie. Like she is a good character. I liked her a lot. She plays it well. Like one of the moments I did like, and it's, I mean, it has some member berries in it, but like when um, she disguises herself as Goro from Mortal Kombat and then pops through with the chest burster. But just when she's like, like clicking her teeth together, she's doing the puppet. Like, I thought that was fun. That was cute. Yeah. No, it was. Yeah. I mean, but, um, but like, that was like her charm coming through in that character. Uh, and so she was really good. But no, Ben Mendelsohn is awesome. He I he's one of those that like in that uh, Michael Pena territory of the best thing of the movie. He's the, the best part of the movie that he's in is him. Yeah. And he like kind of launched onto the scene doing this kind of thing and was immediately great at it and then was cast in everything and rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's um, he's not quite to the Sam Rockwell level of the best part of the movie is him, but he's in that rarefied air, I think. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean. Yeah, I also um, I this is more of an interesting note, like I think the score is pretty good and, and I liked it and I, I would say it maybe borders on a silver lining, uh, but I also Sylvester is awesome. But that's what I was going to say. Interesting to note as well that this is the only film that John Williams uh, did not do the score for a Spielberg movie. And it was because he was working on, uh, I think it was the, the post is that the, he was working on something else for yeah. Spielberg. Uh, and this movie understandably took so long to make because of all the VFX stuff that Spielberg went and made another movie while making this. And so that was why uh, John Williams actually didn't have the time to do the score. So Sylvester, who we talk about a lot on the show and who I do love and uh, who, you know, has written so many memorable things, uh, you know, stepped in and did it. Which also yeah, did he did the Zemeckis. He did Back to the Future. He right? did the original Back to the Future score. Yeah, yeah, that was arguably what put him on the map as a film composer. Which the those notes of the triumphant. You can hear them in your head right now of when Marty mm-hmm. McFly hits 88 miles per hour. The bam, 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 iconic. Bam, 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 bam. It's just it's 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 in. I bet you a lot of people mistakenly think it's John Williams and it's Sylvester. Yeah. And he also wrote the Avengers theme. So really just those two alone. He can you know. what, what, more just good night. Yeah. Take a lap. <laughs> yeah. You did it. You did it for sure. And we did it. I think. Yeah, we did it. I think yeah. we did it. I'm I'm, um, I'm giving us credit. Yeah. Uh, even though the, this movie, one of the more well-reviewed, um, I would say, is this movie, are we the furthest from the critic reviews on this movie relative to any other movie we've talked about? Well, it's it's interesting because you and I talked about this because I, I suggested that we did it and you kind of told me like, well, I don't know, like the the Rotten Tomatoes score is pretty high. It's in the 70s. Even the Metacritic score is like in the 60s. And we do use those things as a guide, but I think what's interesting about this is I think if it's your jam and if you're you're here for the references and you want all the stuff and you kind of know what the deal is, you're going to enjoy it. But I do think we always say maligned and we don't really have a clear metric of what that is. I think the people who don't like this movie very strongly don't like it. Because I, I think and the one thing I mean, we've I've kind of touched on it, 
But fans of the book despise this movie. Right. So I think that is that there are people who feel very strongly about it and very strongly do not like it. And I think that does make it good grounds to discuss uh, because, yeah, it, it's I don't think, you know, people I think people either loved it for what it is, which kind of seems like maybe where you landed on it or went away from it or didn't watch it quite possibly or really went away from it like, oh, which is kind of how I felt, if I'm being honest. It, no, yeah, that that's this movie for me. This is a laundry movie for me. Yeah, it is. It's it's good for that, you know, and there there's a lot of visual stuff to enjoy. You know, it's one of those movies where I can like, we're re- regular TV still a thing and it came on. I could watch 10 minutes of it like it would stop my remote for 10 seconds, you know, a couple minutes to watch a scene or two, depending on what part it is. And then I go about my day like that's that's about where I am in my enjoyment of this movie. Well, don't worry. Uh, pretty soon, once that deal that Disney and uh, Warner, you know, Max like and Hulu all have oh, cable plus. Well, yeah, when they come out with cable plus, I hope they will add a feature of just, you know, watch something. <laughs> They'll just take all this stuff on the channel and just be playing it constantly. And you can just go to that feed and watch uh, whatever Whatever's happens on. to be on. I like if we're really going to get cable back, let's get cable back. You know? Yeah, let's do because TBS, TNT, USA, all that stuff like that's the that was the best part about regular cable. Yeah, I do. And then I think also they should add a feature to these streaming services where you can watch it as it was meant to be seen if you were a teenager with commercials and with all of the swear words poorly dubbed over. Yeah, I really want to watch the last third of Necessary Roughness with uh, everything edited out. <laughs> I want to find a stranger in the Alps. I mean, let's look. We got a Phoebe Bridgers like album out of Stranger in the Alps. That's how iconic that is. Yippee Kaye, Mr. Falcon. I'm tired of these monkey fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane. That's some of the best work that America has produced is slap that's the real american art form yeah you can talk about jazz you can talk about pro wrestling <laughs> you can talk about you can say rock. your prayers you can talk about your john 316 well austin 316 says i just i just w-. dubbed your ass boom boom that was beautiful that was beautiful you've i teed it up for you and then you you hit the home run i love <laughs> it so much uh we have a bonus silver lining right now because i i was not going to leave us in a lurch i knew that we were in good hands and that is i reached out to the brilliant comedian demi adijuebe and asked him if i could have permission to play his rejected theme song to ready player one and that is how we are going to go out this week uh so please enjoy it and uh i i think they should have gone with it frankly like but you know what do I know? Remember King Kong? Remember Ferris Bueller? Remember War Games and Back to the Future? Remember Tomb Raider? Remember Weird Science? Remember Battletoads and the Iron Giant? Remember Star Wars and Transformers the movie? Remember Ghostbusters? Remember the Goonies? Remember when Neon used to be trendy? Remember the Where's the Beef Lady from Wendy's? <laughs> Remember Akira? That's from Japan. Remember Galaga and Mrs. Pac-Man? Remember Contra? Remember Street Fighter? Remember The A-Team? Remember Knight Rider? Remember The Simpsons, seasons one through nine? Remember logging onto America online? Remember Highlander and Highlander 2? Remember Star Trek? We certainly do. Silver Linings Playback is a production of Hobotrashcan.com. If you enjoyed the show, please rate or review it on Apple Podcasts. Hear more great shows on the Peak Sloth Podcast Network.